Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we take an in-depth look at a breaking story that just hit in the last few days on uranium in the drinking water of six million Americans. We talk with Karen Haddon of the Seed Coalition, an environmental watchdog group in Texas, where she has insights into possible implications in this story for the waste isolation pilot plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, the waste control specialist site in Andrews, Texas, Fort Calhoun nuclear reactors, uranium mines, and possibly more. We'll get to that story very shortly. We hear from Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast with the latest insights and information on the Columbia Generating Station in Washington State. And we also receive our sixth lesson on social media super tricks, weekly quick tips on how to get the most out of your anti-nuclear online presence with Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. Plus, our regular numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, and more nuclear information than can fit on the head of a pin or on a pro-nuclear pinhead, all of which will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, August 25th, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. Here's that breaking story with the shocking news that 6 million U.S. residents are drinking uranium-contaminated water that could increase the risk of liver damage and so much more. This is about water from two aquifers in the U.S., that contain uranium levels that are significantly, hate that word usually, but I'll use it here, significantly higher than the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Maximum Contaminant Level, or MCL. Researchers at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln analyzed almost 275,000 groundwater samples collected from about 62,000 locations from two aquifers that provide millions of people in the U.S. with drinking water. These aquifers are known commonly as the High Plains and the Central Valley. The High Plains aquifer is the largest in the U.S. and spans from Texas to South Dakota, stretching over a total of eight states. The study shows that it has uranium concentrations 89 times the EPA's maximum contaminant level. To put that in perspective, the MCL is 15 picocuries per liter whereas what is contained in this aquifer is 1,335 picocuries per liter. The California-based Central Valley Aquifer has even higher concentration levels, with uranium contaminants at 180 times, that's 180 times, the MCL, or 2,700 picocuries per liter of water. The study found that more than three-quarters of the uranium-contaminated sites are linked to the presence of nitrate, a common groundwater contaminant that stems from chemical and animal waste fertilizers. Nitrate, through a series of bacterial and chemical reactions, oxidizes uranium, which then makes it soluble and capable of leaching into groundwater. This raises so many questions that I reached out to learn more. I was able to speak only briefly with the lead researcher of the study, Carrie A. Weber of the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. She was unable to make herself available for an interview, but did answer questions to let me know that the study did not take its own water samples, but performed the equivalent of an epidemiological study based on tests for uranium in drinking water by the USGS, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the EPA. She and her research partner, Jason Nolan, did the analysis, and the study was funded by the University of Nebraska. To further explore the implications of this shocking report, I contacted Karen Haddon, Executive Director of the Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition, or SEED Coalition, an environmental watchdog group in Texas, to consider whether nuclear problems in that state may have contributed to the problem. 
Karen Haddon, so good to have you back on Nuclear Hot Seat. I'm so glad to be here. Karen, when I saw this study that came through talking about the uranium contamination in the aquifers and saw the map that it went down into Texas, it seemed suspicious to me that it showed a concentration in the area that we previously discussed a nuclear hot seat about waste control specialists, or WCS, in Andrews, Texas. That is the site that has been accepting the waste that the RIP site in Carlsbad has not been allowed to accept since Valentine's Day 2014 and the underground accident there. Let's talk a little bit about the history of WCS and that aquifer. WCS, or Waste Control Specialist, has a so-called low-level radioactive waste site in Andrews County, Texas, on the New Mexico border. And it's right where the right angle of the panhandle goes up so that you can kind of visualize where this is. They've been taking waste, all except the fuel rods, from nuclear reactors around the whole country for several years now. They also have a pit that has Fernald, Ohio, weapons waste that has been buried, and that site is already full. And they have a third pit for federal waste that takes things from all of our nuclear weapons facilities around the country. So they have a lot of radioactive waste there. And as you mentioned, one of the things of great concern is that they recently took the barrels from the WIP site, potentially exploding barrels, and they've got those about 180 feet deep in an open pit that has just some gravel poured on top. Now, according to our last conversation on the show, WCS both is and is not sited over <laughs> at the Oglala Aquifer. Explain <laughs> what happened and how that was apparently manipulated. Uh, yes. Um, the original Texas Water Development Board map show that the Ogallala Aquifer was, in fact, under the site where Waste Control Specialists has their radioactive waste. Several years ago, they worked together with the Texas Tech University and submitted a bunch of data, and they got the aquifer boundaries moved north of their site. Today, their geologist would tell you that while there is no physical barrier between the waters under their site and the Ogallala, that it's not a part of the main Ogallala, which is about, in their opinion, six miles north of the site. So the Texas Water Development Board actually did, in fact, change those maps. The company maintains that they are not over the aquifer. However, they are definitely very close. And just one last point, I recall that WCS was owned by a billionaire who I believe has since passed away who was also on the board at Texas Tech. Kent Hance was on the board, and Harold Simmons owned the company. And Kent Hance is no longer chancellor of Texas Tech, but is in an, a chancellor emeritus position while also being a vice president of waste control specialists. So he has a very big hand in this whole thing. Now the waste control specialists is owned and run by two of Harold Simmons' daughters. So the connection is still there. Absolutely. Now, the aquifers that are in question in connection with this study are the High Plains and the Central Valley, yet we're talking here about the Oglala Aquifer. What's the connection? Well, the Ogallala is the High Plains Aquifer. They are one and the same, and it's a huge aquifer that goes under eight states in the United States, and it basically is the major agricultural central portion of our country. So what correlation, just to hypothesize here, because we can't know for sure at this moment, what correlation might there be between the uranium contamination of the Ogallala or High Plains Aquifer and WCS? We cannot say yet. I think it's always good to look at this. I think there needs to be a, a lot more study done, but certainly we want to know if WCS is involved. And there are actually a number of nuclear and radioactive facilities that I think should be highly 
examined here. One of those also is the Pantex plant in Amarillo, which is where they've been doing weapons assembly and disassembly for a long, long time. And they have been a super fun site in the past. So that is sitting right on the Ogallala as well. And since this uranium is showing up in the water, especially in Texas and Nebraska, I think that all the facilities in this region, the WIP site in New Mexico, the reactors in Nebraska, Fort Calhoun that just got flooded in Nebraska, all of these sites need to be really investigated. It might turn out that there's nothing at all other than an agricultural connection, but I think we need to know, especially when we're talking about the drinking water of 6 million people being at risk, this is really incredibly dangerous. One of the points that was made by this study is that 78% of the uranium-contaminated sites are linked to the presence of nitrate, which is a common groundwater contaminant that stems from chemical and animal waste fertilizers. I'm quoting from the study here. Nitrate through a series of bacterial and chemical reactions oxidizes uranium, which then makes it soluble and capable of leaching into the groundwater. The question then becomes, where is that uranium coming from that the nitrates can then have this effect upon? Yes, and that is exactly right. This is what raises questions for me, too. And I read the report, and what I could see it was a little unclear. We don't know if this is simply uranium that is existing in a non-reactive state, and then it gets oxidized in a chemical reaction by the nitrates, or whether there's something more involved. And to me, this study is an incredibly important one that just points out the need for numerous additional studies. And they need to be done quickly because this is a serious health risk. It's a health risk not only for those who are exposed to the drinking water, but because so much of that aquifer water, I believe the figure is 40%, is used in agricultural uses to water the crops that then grow and can potentially uptake the uranium into whatever the food is that's being created. This could be contaminating food in what is arguably the bread basket of the United States. Absolutely, and this aquifer, it stretches from the Panhandle in the northern part of Texas, and it has the eastern edge of New Mexico. It goes into the western half of Kansas, eastern edge of Colorado, almost the whole state of Nebraska, part of Wyoming and South Dakota. So literally, it's millions of people in terms of water, and absolutely, it, it's a risk in agriculture and livestock. So I think we need to also look at our food supply. Where would you suggest those of us who are within the movement, the anti-nuclear movement, turn to do the next levels of investigation and checking this out? Who would you suggest get involved in this? Which organizations or which forms of study? Absolutely, we need to get our universities involved. This one came out of the University of Nebraska. And we need to call on legislative leaders, congressional leaders, to help ensure that this happens immediately. The NRC as well, they should be pushing for this. Not that they're likely to take action. The NRC is often way behind in trying to protect public safety. So we need academic studies that are thorough and complete and anywhere and everywhere that we can raise this issue, we need to be looking, especially at all nuclear sites and radioactive sites anywhere near the Ogallala Aquifer. I've also seen some maps that came out from Leona Morgan and the native people in the southwest who have maps of old uranium mining sites that might be implicated as well. So that might be another direction to check out. The uh, study addressed that to just a limited extent. They talked about some sites had a little bit higher uranium in the water when they were near mining pits, but it wasn't as definitive as they expected which is why I think we need to look further. Now, if it turns out that it's not nuclear facilities 
and that this is just because of agricultural nitrates, we really need to figure that out too because if it can act on uranium that's in soils to this extent, we absolutely have to figure that out. You know, there may be more involved in that, but we do definitely need to know. What would you suggest to listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat and those who are active within this community, some of them at some very accomplished levels, what would you suggest we do to try and stir this up so that the story does not get buried and whatever research is necessary does continue forward? Well, the article that I saw that was most important to me is one called Six Million U.S. Residents Are Drinking Uranium-Contaminated Water that could increase risk of liver damage. And that appeared in the Science Business Insider section. Just ran August 18th by Barbara Tosh. And I think that this article should be forwarded to local news outlets and media as much as possible, anywhere and everywhere, and ask them to cover this story and demand that further research be done. We do have to figure this out. The impacts are are just amazingly incredible, and this is a lot of people involved. So we do have to get on this and get all of the information we can get. There were 275,000 groundwater sampled at 62,000 locations. So we need detailed data, and we need to figure out more about the patterns involved. And, of course, we do not at this time know how long this exposure has been going on with the understanding that any exposure to radionuclides within the body is cumulative over the life of a person. Absolutely. And that's a key piece, too. Is this something that was existing before there was a lot of use of nitrates in agriculture? Is it something that occurred when one of these facilities started leaking? We really do need to know. Karen, I'm going to stay in touch with you to get your further updates and further insights into the story, and we will be tracking it on Nuclear Hot Seat to do what we can to stir this up. Any final thoughts you would like to leave us with? I thank you for your coverage because it's really important, and this is an issue everyone needs to pay attention to. It includes as well the Central Valley Aquifer in California. So I think that we all need to be figuring out what's going on and talking to the media. Just to go off from that, because I'm here in California, you are implying or you are saying that if this is a nitrate interacting with otherwise inert uranium, let alone uranium sources, this could be impacting the California Central Valley as well. Absolutely, and the study seems to indicate that this could also be involved. The uh, Business Insider article says that the California-based Central Valley Aquifer has even higher concentration levels with uranium concentrations 180 times the MCL and nitrate concentration levels 34 times the MCL. And throughout the study, the researchers keep pointing out the correlation between finding the nitrates and the uranium. So definitely, we need to look at this. And just for clarification, MCL refers to maximum contaminant level, a level by the EPA. And the uh, article points out that the uranium concentrations in the Ogallala, or High Plains area, are up to 89 times the EPA's maximum contaminant level. So these are very high levels. And there's nothing to say that the level that the EPA sets as a maximum is safe in and of itself. (laughs) That's definitely a question I would ask as well. Lots of questions to be asked, lots of follow-up to be done. Karen, Thank you for these insights and these indications of exactly how important this story is. And you come across any information, do let us know here at Nuclear Hot Seat. You have time and space on this program anytime you need it to keep us informed. Thank you. Thanks to Nuclear Hot Seat. Be well and don't drink the water.
That was Karen Haddon, Executive Director of the Sustainable Energy and Economic Development Coalition, or SEED Coalition, an environmental watchdog group in Texas. As you could tell from the interview, we do not know how long this problem with uranium in the aquifer water has existed, whether known nuclear sites have contributed to the radiation levels, whether nitrate use is now implicated in any agricultural area where uranium might be located, and so much more. So what we're asking is that if you are in or know people who are in any of the states that were mentioned, Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, South Dakota, Wyoming, Kansas, Colorado, or New Mexico, or the Central Valley area in California, we ask that you bring this study to the attention of local media, water districts, public health officials and politicians, up to and including your congressperson, senator, and the governor. That 6 million people are estimated to be drinking uranium-contaminated water is a public health disaster in the making. We know that radiation causes cancer, and cancer rates have been soaring nonstop to where it's now estimated that one in three men and one in two women will get it sometime in our lives. And internal contamination is far more devastating to health than external exposure. This may be our pivotal issue in bringing nuclear dangers to the forefront of the public's consciousness. So do what you can from your end, and I'll do what I can from here. Moving on to more nuclear news, actually radiation news, which seems to be this week's theme. In Frederickstown, Pennsylvania, high levels of radiation, up to 60, 60 times higher than the maximum allowed in drinking water, have been found in a stream that feeds into a water treatment plant where ultimately the water ends up in Pittsburgh. This radiation is in the form of radium, which cannot be easily gotten rid of through standard filtering processes. Fracking wastewater is implicated in this, and since the half-life of radium-226 is 1,600 years, this problem is going to be around for a long, long time. But of course, the EPA says residents should not be worried. When's a good time for them to get worried? Gina never met a nuke I didn't love and cover for McCarthy, who is head of the EPA. You will let us know, won't you? The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has confirmed that it has found radioactive contamination at residential properties along Coldwater Creek in North St. Louis County. What is being labeled low-dose contamination has been found in the soil around what is being labeled a handful of homes immediately adjacent to the creek. Meanwhile, the Corps of Engineers is digging up and removing radioactive soil from a local park. That park is remaining open during the cleanup, and residents are being told that there's no increased risk to the public while we remediate. Yeah. What's the source of the radioactivity? Starting in the 1940s, radioactive waste from nuclear weapons production was dumped at a number of sites throughout the St. Louis area. With rain, flooding, and the movement of groundwater, Radioactive materials were carried from those sites into Coldwater Creek. And in Sanders, Arizona, at least eight well samplings revealed the presence of elevated levels of uranium in the water supply. The approximately 300 residents in the local area have been cautioned to stop using the contaminated water for drinking, bathing, cooking, and cleaning. The elevated levels of uranium has been linked to the Church Rock uranium mill spill of 1979, which has been discussed in depth with Leona Morgan on nuclear hot seat number 214. Over to Japan, where all eyes are on the Sendai nuclear power plant in Kagoshima Prefecture. The first reactor restarted since the post-Fukushima shutdown. But it's not good news for Kyushu Electric Power Company, the owners and operators. Last Friday, August 21st, only 10 days after the restart, seawater is believed to have flowed into one of the three condensers in the reactor's secondary cooling system. The company, using a very high-tech approach, blocks it to any any holes. Yeah, that would really work. So the thing's already leaking. Meanwhile, 50 kilometers or 31 miles away, volcano Sakurajima, which has been threatening to erupt, 
eased back from the possibility of a large eruption far enough that an evacuation advisory was lifted as of Saturday, August 22nd. But wait, there's more. Now the nuclear reactor at Sendai is directly in the path of Typhoon Goni, which was poised to make landfall at Kyushu, the island that Sendai is on, as of Tuesday morning. Before making landfall, the typhoon registered maximum wind speed of 159 miles per hour, and tides were expected to reach near 40 feet. The Japanese government has issued alerts for landslides and floods, and this is what's going to hit a nuclear reactor that is already showing cracks in five, count them five, pipes. Up in Fukushima, Radiation levels in the abandoned towns near the wreckage of the power plant are 19 times higher in radiation than considered safe for humans. But of course, that's not stopping the government from forcing,、uh, promising the evacuees that they will be able to return to their homes by 2017, even though it's predicted that the cleanup may take 200 years or longer. Internationally, New Zealanders who eat a lot of seafood may be exposing themselves to radiation and putting their health at risk, according to a new study. Researchers measured the levels of radioactive cesium and polonium in 36 kinds of seafood and found the highest levels of radiation in slapjack tuna, green shell mussels, paua, queen scallop, rock lobster, bluff oysters, and little neck clams. The irony? Is that New Zealand is a nuclear-free country and has been since 1987? The International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, has issued a warning, urging the world community to intensify efforts to protect nuclear facilities from possible cyber attack. IAEA Director General Yukia Amano says there should be a serious attempt at protecting nuclear and radioactive materials, since quote. Reports of actual or attempted cyber attacks are now virtually a daily occurrence. A director at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute said, "Any corruption, malware, or targeted attacks potentially could have catastrophic consequences for nuclear safety and security." You think? Then maybe it's a good thing the U.S. is still managing much of its nuclear missile capability through floppy disks. Old technology, and now nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that sound a week. A retired Israeli scientist searching for what she's calling a vaccine for nuclear radiation for the past six years has been injecting herself with small doses of hydrogen peroxide. What? Professor Brenda Lassiter was the director of the radiology lab at the Department of Nuclear Engineering at Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. This adherent of hormesis, yes, this is what it looks like, folks, claims to have documented what she called an immune response in mice three weeks after they began drinking water laced with hydrogen peroxide. Now, water that's subjected to ionizing radiation forms free radicals of hydrogen that can recombine to form gaseous hydrogen peroxide. But does that make the hydrogen peroxide radioactive? Couldn't figure that one out. And in last week's nuclear hot seat number two seventeen, Doctor Ian fairly eviscerated the hormesis theory by pointing out that tickle doses, which is the technical term for these small doses. Had in some experiments shown that when larger amounts of radiation were later given, the damage done is less than if no previous small amount was given. But on the other hand, according to Dr. Fairley, other cell and animal studies using different doses, durations, and endpoints failed to show this effect, and there is no human evidence from epidemiology that it works. Professor Laster has been injecting herself with this solution for six years, but it takes twelve to fifteen years for hard tumors to start showing up after exposure to radiation. So, darling, you've got another six years or longer to, before you find out that you were wrong, and that's why, Professor Brenda Laster, you are this week's nuclear hot seat. None that's out of week. Oi. 
We'll have our second featured interview in just a moment. But first, as you're probably aware by now, the Nuclear Hot Seat website got taken down, and we're still working to get it back up and running. Progress is being made, but there's a four-year history on the database, so the work is intense and ongoing. I want to thank those of you who have already donated to the Nuclear Hot Seat website fix fund. We've raised close to two-thirds of the monies necessary to create an improved, more functional, and safe to a nuclear containment vessel level protected website. That includes the entire archive of 217, as of today, 218 episodes. There's still an emergency landing page up at NuclearHotSeat.com where you can access links to the last few weeks of shows. That's where you'll also find a secure link to make a donation, either through PayPal or directly from your credit or debit card. As I said, we're close to two-thirds of the way towards being able to go ahead on the complete website fix, but donations are still needed to get us over the top. So if you've ever thought of donating to Nuclear Hot Seat, please don't wait for the end of the year. Now is the perfect time. Any amount is appreciated, and no amount is insignificant. Every donation, no matter the size, I take as a sign that you care about the show and that that alone helps me to keep it and me going. So please, don't wait. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com to find the secure donate link. And if you prefer to not donate online, you can email me for a snail mail address to send your donation. Know that I am deeply touched, not only by the generosity of you, the listeners, but some of the notes I've gotten have really touched me very deeply. So whatever you can do to help, you have my everlasting gratitude. Southeastern Washington State is home to the Columbia Generating Station, and we're fortunate that Mimi German is an activist focusing on that site. Mimi is one of the founders of both No Nukes Northwest and Radcast, which promotes citizen monitoring of all sites nuclear. A woman of many talents, she was also one of the Kai activists who participated in the recent Greenpeace bridge-dangling blockade of Shell Oil's Arctic drilling-bound icebreaker, Fenica. She joins us here to discuss the Columbia Generating Station, the Hanford site, the dangers to the adjacent Columbia River, and what she likes to call the nuclear mafiosa. Mimi Gurman, always a pleasure to have you here on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me back. You've been doing great work regarding the Columbia Generating Station, and in starting out, I want to get clear on what the Columbia Generating Station is and its relationship to the Hanford site, which is in the same area, because I think there's some confusion as to what those two are as distinct or as conjoined entities. You're right, and thanks for asking that. So Hanford is a waste site. Um, we have waste from all over coming into Hanford, and, and there are 177 tanks, many of which are leaking. And in the early days of the Hanford site, it was legal to just come and dump radioactive chemicals directly into the river and into these tunnels, these, you know, ground trenches. And in fact, on the Hanford site, they have photos of these. So this is a known thing. There is a radioactive plume that is underground at Hanford heading towards the Columbia River. At some point, it will hit the Columbia River and add to the radioactivity that's already in the waters. Next to that, on the same Hanford Reserve, is the Columbia Generating Station, which is a nuclear power plant. And most people don't know that there is a nuclear power plant that is working I shouldn't really say working, that is online creating power for Washington and then surrounding states. Some of the energy that's created there gets sold through the Bonneville Power Association, which we call the BPA, and they're an important player in the mafiosa. And they sell 
that nuclear energy to California and different states, as well as some of that, 3.9% of that energy staying in Washington state. So it's a very negligible amount of energy in Washington. And as we look into the dangers of nuclear power in general and the Columbia Generating Station in this instance, we can see that not only don't we need the power from this nuclear power plant that's decrepit, cracked, and eroding in front of us, but we already can move into efficiencies. We can move further into solar. There's a lot of room for solar. There's a lot of room to continue with wind buildup. And all of that means jobs. You said two things in that period of time that I want to revisit. One of them is you referred to the nuclear mafiosa, which I think is a great term. But the other, which is disturbing, is that you mentioned that this is an eroding and corroding nuclear reactor or nuclear facility. That is not hyperbole. That's based on fact. Why don't we start with that one and what exactly are the problems that you know about that are at the CGS? Well, I'd love to talk about these. And one of the ways that we talk about them is through this term, which is called an event. And an event, I think, should be retermed a hazard. We should call these things hazards instead of events because events takes the power and the immediacy of danger out of what is really going on. And by event, you're talking about this is an official label from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission when they say there has been an event at a nuclear facility. Yes, this is not like a party. This is a major problem. And any time there is an event or a major hazard which occurs at a nuclear facility, that facility must report that event, no matter how small or how large, to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And if they don't, they get fined incredible amounts of money. And if they do report it, not only don't they get fined, but they are never made to correct whatever the event was in the first place. And that is what's important to understand. The NRC, as part of this mafiosa, is the regulatory commission that not only doesn't regulate, but it will never tell a nuclear power plant to fix something in an appropriate amount of time or go back and make sure that that fix has been made at all if it did suggest that that fix be made, which caused the event in the first place. I know that I have come to the awareness that the purpose of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is not, as their slogan says, to protect people and the environment, but that the purpose of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is to manage the panic of the people should they become aware of the dangers of the nuclear facilities around the country. That's exactly right. This is like the most high-end gated community that we have. The gates are in place to make sure that we never know what is going on at a nuclear power plant. The only things that the public at large has ever heard regarding dangers at a nuclear power plant is Chernobyl, which was a meltdown, and Fukushima. We're lucky if they remember any issues that happened at Three Mile Island. And in the meantime, we have events slash hazards Every single day that are listed and the public can access these, and I encourage you to try this as a reading program for your day. Note that a way of finding that URL will be included at the end of this report. And when you do that, you can plug in a date, any date. You can look at any day and see events at any particular nuclear site that has reported them, and you will see them Every single day. Mimi, you recently published an article with Counterpunch online in which you cited 11 separate NRC events at the Columbia Generating Station in just the past four months. This seems both excessive and worrisome. 
there were a few things in here that really struck me. First of all, you pointed out that a large number of events took place around refueling and that we know that there is a spike in radiation that happens during refueling. One of the things that I have learned is that the reason that we're not more aware of these radiation spikes is that radiation is usually averaged out over a year so that by the time the amount of radiation is spread out over 365 days, it looks like it's minuscule, as opposed to going, no, the majority of it happened during this 8, 10, 12, 24-hour period of time when we had this huge spike and the exposure level was that much higher that people were going through. So I think that was significant. And then there's this notation, maybe you can speak to it, that July 8th through July 10th, RADNET, which are the monitors that are put in place by the Environmental Protection Agency to alert us to any problems that might be existing, on those days, RADNET shut down the monitors. Any idea why that happened? I have my feelings about why it happens. There were events on either side of that shutdown. And the events don't need to be reported the day of the event. The event might have happened two days before the report to the NRC. And the event date usually is posted just as the date that the NRC puts it up. Um, There's often a, a referral to when the event did take place. But again, that's when it gets called in. So my feeling about when they turn things off, we saw this back in 2011 after Fukushima happened. We saw this in RADNET monitors on the West Coast, where after about three weeks, the monitors were off and reporting nothing for a while. They turned them up again, but we see this across the United States at different times. This is the first time, though, that we've been able to, with going back and forth between the events from the Columbia Generating Station, from the NRC, when we compare them to what the EPA was putting out, meaning the RADNET monitors, we can see that there were issues with radiation. So, in other words, an event took place, the monitor was shut down, There was a spike when the monitor was turned up, and we don't know what happened in between. That's what we do know. We know that we have no idea what the radiation was during that shutdown. And when asked, you know, why do do I think they shut it down? I think there was a problem. And in order for that problem to not get out to the public, which is the job of the NRC, back to that, that what we have is is exactly that. They just shut it off and nobody knows and you can't find out. Was there any citizen monitoring taking place during that time? I know that you are involved with RADCAST, which is very much a citizen radiation monitoring group. We don't have anyone in the area that we know of who has Geiger counters and can watch this area for us. And it's incredibly unfortunate. And if anyone listening is in the area of eastern Washington, western Idaho, it would be really helpful if you could get in touch with us and perhaps think about getting a Geiger counter so that we can have a better idea on what is happening in the community around CGS. With what you have been discovering there, What, if any kind of activist response, do you believe is appropriate and necessary at this time? At this point, I believe that this article, that the work comparing events and notifications about events to the radiation data, which does show that there are spikes when these particular events are occurring, we have an obligation to go to, in this case in Washington, the senators, and demand that CGS be shut down and teach them that jobs will not only not be lost by shutting down CGS, but there's an opportunity for real leadership. And that is the first, doing the right thing for the environment, which is shutting this plant down, doing the right thing by the workers, which we now know from the studies of Dr. Ian Fairley, whom you've interviewed numerous times, that workers at nuclear power plants do have a higher rate of leukemia. So doing the right thing by the workers, doing the right thing by the community, shutting this down, keeping the workers necessary to shut down this nuclear power plant in place, 
while making sure that the other workers move into wind energy, which is already taking place in Washington, boost the solar production in Washington, which can be boosted, especially with climate change, and do more with efficiencies, which they're already doing so much with. And one of the things that's happened is the second largest municipality or public utility district in Washington is Clark County, which is just over the river uh, from Portland. It's Vancouver, Washington. It's in, it's, it's right by us. And they just created a solar array and they want to extend that out further. These people on the PUD in Clark County, while understanding that solar is necessary, are refusing to create a no vote for the usage of CGS. So there is such dissonance between the understanding of why nuclear power is terrible and why we need to move into solar and wind. And that's the kind of thing I feel like educating politicians is where activism also needs to go into. Do you know what I mean? They don't understand. They're in such a bubble that they still believe that nuclear power is a necessity, even if it's only creating 3.9% of the energy in Washington, which is so negligible. And this is a distinction I just learned, that there is a difference between energy being created and electricity being created. And I'm wondering if in the dissonance between those two words, the 3.9% is even a smaller percentage because it's electricity, but it's not necessarily all of the energy that's being created. I think that's a great point. And we know with nuclear power that the larger point is that we don't even need that to create any electricity because we have hydro, wind, and solar in Washington. So I think education is really key, and it's not just about educating your neighbor. It's about educating the politicians who have control to shut these plants down because whether we are content with them or not, they don't understand this. I agree with you completely. And the other piece that I would add is that it is necessary to educate the media, those people who are reporting in the local newspapers, though I understand that Richland is pretty much a company town, so you might have difficulties there. But in Washington State, you do have Susanna Frame at King 5, who has been on a special investigative reporter beat at Hanford for the last two years and is completely supported by her management in getting the stories. So certainly she would be someone to reach out to. I've interviewed her for the show and she's wonderful. She's completely open to any information she can get on these issues, but also take it to the other TV and radio stations and anybody who's in the broadcast radius, which is not necessarily coming from Richland, but can come from communities surrounding it where that's in the listening audience, the FCC area, so that they can have some concept, some fighting chance of communicating the truth about what's going on. I couldn't agree more. And even further still, one of the things that we're working on is to educate unions to go into unions, and everybody's got their local, to go in there activists in nuclear communities should be doing this now, taking my article taking articles, uh, Ian Fairley's article on leukemia in workers at nuclear power plants and taking this to the labor union heads and getting meetings with them, demand meetings with them, explain to them with the visuals of these articles what is going on and explain to them the necessity of moving and training and reteaching laborers to do other types of jobs that are safe for themselves and their families, their futures, and also positive for the environment. We're really working hard on that right now in Washington, and it's a slow, it's a slow grind. But I think that we can create and locate sanity there and let that emanate outwards and let the labor unions speak for us. Mimi, it's so good to know that you are up there on point on this issue and that there are others who have joined with you to fight against CGS. And I don't know that we could be in better hands, 
do stay in touch and let us know when there are any further developments up there because we would always want to hear from you. And for now, thank you for being my guest on this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you so much for having me. That was Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org. The link to find the NRC events has too long a URL to mention here. But if you Google NRC, comma, events, listings, comma, URL, it will come up. Now it's time for another hit of online wisdom and advice from Dave Parrish of Operation Save the Earth. He's back with Nuclear Hot Seat's Social Media Super Tricks for Activists. This one's number six, YouTube. Hey guys, it's Dave from Operation Save the Earth, and this is part six of our eight-part social media super trick series. There are some bonus tricks in this edition, so pay close attention. Last week, we talked about the importance of visuals in both the evolution of the web and for the cause itself. What's even more powerful than pretty pictures? Videos! For many years on the web, slow modems and processors kept video from being much more than an eternally buffering annoyance. Things changed, though, in 2005 when YouTube made its debut, a website where uploading and sharing video content was easily done for the first time. Over the past 10 years, YouTube has quickly evolved into one of the top three destinations on the web with over 1 billion users worldwide. Most importantly, YouTube has become the second biggest search engine in the world, and that's important for us. Sure, our videos rarely go viral, not when there's lolcats and Taylor Swift to watch instead, but that's not the point. Your first super trick of the week is, if you don't have your own YouTube channel, make one right now. It's super easy and it's free. Second super trick, subscribe to Miss Milky the Clown 1. Missing Sky 101, and so many other Fuku Fighter channels that have been out there since day one. If all you do is mirror videos from those channels on yours, guess what? You'll not only be getting excellent real info on the crisis, but you'll also be feeding the search engine spiders with your hashtag Fukushima content as well. So, here's your third and final super trick of the week. Tag your quality shares and creations. Hashtag Fukushima. Hashtag Fukushima Daiichi. All one word. Use your keywords and feed those spiders. Even if you're camera shy and don't want to be the next YouTube superstar, that's okay. You can still have a voice using this platform. Bonus points if you connect your account to your Twitter. You'll be amplifying your message times two. That's your super trick, or super tricks for the week. We'll see you next time. Dave Parrish of OperationSaveTheEarth.com Dave hosts Fuku Friday Happy Hour Hangout every Friday at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 p.m. Pacific on Google+. And you can join him there for more of his high-energy ideas. Activist shout-out! Thanks again this week to Cindy Folkers of Beyond Nuclear for alerting me to the fact that the NRC has extended the period of time for comments on its proposal to change the way it evaluates radiation exposure risks. They are considering changing from the long-standing, scientifically proven linear no-threshold model, which states that any exposure to radiation is potentially dangerous and that it is cumulative over our lifetimes, that there is no safe dose, and hormesis, which I like to call whoreusis, radiation denial, that states that radiation at low levels is good for you. Now, the NRC specializes in long, confusing links that I would normally post on the website, but it's still down, so I can't. But if you Google NRC, comma, petition, comma, hormesis, which is spelled H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S, the link will come up as Federal Register, Linear No Threshold Model. Click on that. It will take you to the petition where you can click on the green Submit a Formal Comment button. Now, you don't have to get dressed up for this formal comment. Just give it your best shot in English and try to hold the swear words down. It's great that the NRC is giving us more time to comment, 
But considering they never do anything altruistic to the anti-nuclear side of the equation, it probably means that the pro-nukers were having too much difficulty getting their stuff together to make comments in the August heat, the back to school, the Labor Day, and the stock market insanity. So, the NRC extended the deadline for comments to November 19. Still, don't procrastinate. The time to make your comments is now. Which leads me most naturally into today's final thought. Given the number of radiation-related problems cited in this week's news, I think it's no accident that the NRC is trying to terminally confuse the issue of what constitutes a dangerous dose of radiation. Let's not let them get away with it, and for that, we need numbers. So here is a suggestion. ENEnews.com is a reliable, important weekly source of information for this show, a brilliant aggregator of nuclear news from all over the world. The site has also attracted and maintains a large, savvy community of commentators, probably including many of you among them. But for those on the site who perhaps have not taken advantage of the opportunity to make their wishes known to the NRC, how about we give them a little bit of a boost? Why don't we all post to ENA News on any of their stories and encourage their followers to contact the NRC on this very important issue? If we can enlist the hundreds of supporters that ENE News has, we can swell the number of people responding to this hormesis radiation denial nonsense so that even if the NRC extends the comment period to the 12th of never, our perspective that all radiation exposure is bad and there is no safe dose can still have the upper hand. Post the contact information and why they need to comment under any of the stories at enenews.com. Now, be polite. These are good folks. They're on our side. And just remind them that this is an easy and important action to take and that we need the help of each and every one of them. Then, if you're still in the mood, and if you're in any of the states impacted by the uranium contamination, get on the horn and contact your politicians, water and public health departments, universities, especially those with large ag schools because of the nitrate connection, and bring them all up to speed on what they've been living with by giving them a link to the article. To send them the link to the article, just Google, 6 million U.S. residents are drinking uranium-contaminated water. That should do it. Let's make the biggest noise we can, because attention must be paid. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, August 25th, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, businessinsider.com, wtae.com, desmogblog.com, bsnorel.blogspot.ca, stlpublicradio.org, newworks.org, the Boston Globe, NHK, the japannews.com, reuters.com, Kyoto, Gigi, PTI, Fukushima Diary, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, mirror.co.uk, asahi.com, radiation-free Lakeland, commondreams.org, theengineer.co.uk, threenews.co.nz, nuclear-news.net, independent.co.uk, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Jern School Dropouts at World Nuclear News, and the stalwart anti-nuclear army of the Nuclear Hot Seat Community on Facebook, which you are all invited to join. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompanied by John Barnard. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on iTunes under podcasts. You can also find it under YouTube, just like Dave Parrish suggested. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. So don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat.
the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.